in case you forget. Now, I was watching the news last night as it was talking about the importance of moving your clocks forward. Thank God some of us have smartphones. They think for us. So we're glad that you're here this morning. But one of the things they said is that the, the, the popular dislike of the moving of the clocks back and forward by so many people, one of the reasons they said 79% of the people feel that they can't focus the next day at all. That's probably why some of you forgot to wear your wrist bracelet. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> now, you say, what is that? You weren't here last Sunday, so you're completely forgiven. The rest will, we will, we will uh, flog later <laughs> at the stoning pit. Meet us out there. But it's right behind the church. No, we are glad that you're here. Either way, with it or without it, amen? But if you didn't get one last week, you say, I didn't get one of those wrist bracelets. Basically, on one side it says believer, on the other side it says ashamed. It's our reminder to be a witness each and every day. So wear it every day, all right? It's, it's two colors, so it'll go with whatever you're wearing. <laughs> and if it doesn't, you just turn it to the side, you know, whichever side, just hides it the best for you. So. <laughs> you don't want to hide it. So if you didn't get one of these last week, raise your hand just for a moment. Hold up high, hold up high. Worst, I asked for two ushers. We end up with one. Somebody help the man out. Have him out there. There you go, Joel. Joel, faster. Move faster. Come on, Joel. Shake a leg, man. Get over there. Hey, hey, Bill, 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 come back. Give Joel some bands. Okay. All right, hold your hand up if you didn't get one. That's a good shot, wasn't it? It's right there at your feet, Ron. Pass it around to somebody and get one. That's kind of fun to get another one here. <laughs> But it is important, especially ties into what we've been sharing last week and this week and for the next couple of weeks about just daring to live the new life that is ours in, in Jesus Christ. The, the new life that we've been called to live is all a part of our identity and who we really are. Unfortunately, there's so many people that don't remember who they are. But we have this new life in Christ. And I really believe that many Christians fail to live up to that, that real standard you know, that, we, that we've been called up to and a lot of it has to go back with, I think they have an identity crisis of just knowing who they really are. I believe most Christians will live below the, the in fact, not just below, but I believe they'll live far below what God has intended for their life and fulfilling his purposes for their life and will ultimately have little impact in their life because they just don't know about this new life and who they really are. And this thing about Christianity, well, I remember as a child, my mom said, now son, you need to act like a Christian. Well, I tried. I wasn't a good actor in that regard. And that's the thing with Christianity. It's not acting. It's, it's being what you are. God has done the work already in you. And in, it's, it's, it's ingrained in the very fabric of your life now. He is in you. He lives in you. You're, you're, you're the temple which he dwells in. And I, I really don't believe anything becomes more foundational to our freedom in Jesus. A lot of people living in spiritual bondage. I don't think there's anything that's really more foundational to your freedom in Christ than really understanding who you are. When you really get a grip on who you are in Christ and what God has done for you, and you begin to realize that identity, and it, become, it becomes a part of your perceived identity. It's, you know this. This is who I am. Then the more you're going to see victory in your life, the less you're going to struggle in your life. Not that you're not going to have difficulties or problems or complications or even moments, but there, you're going to discover that there's, a, there's this whole new life that you're, you have in Christ and you won't see yourself as some helpless victim caught in a spiritual tug of war between God and the devil. You know, the little, the little devil on one shoulder and the, you know, the, the angel on the other shoulder. You won't find yourself in that capacity anymore. You'll see yourself, when this becomes a reality, you'll see yourself as a dearly loved, accepted child of God, walking in grace that has what you know you need to have. You'll start living your life differently. And I know that this is part of a growing process. It's part of the, 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 we are made a new creature, but yet it's this, there's this perception that we have to begin to embrace. There's the word of God that we have to read. There's the truth of God's word that we have to understand. And the more that we begin to really read and, and understand scripture, and the more we see who we are according to what scripture says, I think the more we'll dare to live the new life that's ours in Jesus Christ. Our passage of scripture today is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Now, I have used this verse, I think even the last two or three weeks in a row, I have mentioned this verse. I probably use it about every other Sunday of my messages at least because it's just one of those anthem verses that always just kind of is it's, it's out there. 
for us to embrace. I, I call this at one time the Baptist anthem because there wasn't ever a Baptist I run into that didn't know the scripture. You could start out far and say, therefore, if any man in Christ, he is, and they'll say, a new creature. Old things pass away, all things come new. It's, it's a known passage of scripture. I've used it a lot in preaching, but I began to realize I've never preached on it. I've preached through entire books of the Bible and all kinds, of, and I've made reference to this passage many times in other sermons, but just to take in, in, in theological terms to exegete the passage where you break it down and look at it grammatically and look at the, in the, uh, the application of it. Uh, I, I hadn't really done that. And what passage in scripture really declares more plainly than this one that, hey, if you are in Christ, you are a new creation, a new creature. You, you're different. You're unique. So let's look at this passage today, and not just this only. I want to read to the end of the chapter here, which is just verse 21, and the first couple of uh, verses in the next chapter. Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now all these things, these new things, they're from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were entreating through us, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He made him to be sin for us. He who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And working together with him, not underline those words, amen, working together with him, we urge you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, at the acceptable time I listened to you, and, as the, and on the day of salvation I helped you. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. What he's saying here is, hey, Now's the time to, to accept, receive, and believe what God says about you. Uh, uh, sometimes we think of salvation in the context of, uh, well, I, I, I gave my life to Christ. I'm going to heaven. Praise the Lord, I'm saved. And it's good to be saved. But salvation involves much, much more than just the introduction to Christ. You know, that's the doorway. We come into salvation. We know Jesus personally is our Lord and Savior. We're forgiven of our sins. We're made, our, made new people. And the salvation begins in our life. I am saved and praise God, I am going to be saved on that day, you know, whether it's by rapture, resurrection, and I'm received forever into glorified body, into the presence of God. Salvation is utmost tense is, is that moment of glorification. But in the process, that salvation is working in my heart. It's making me more like Jesus each day. Hopefully, I'm understanding what it means to be a new creation, and that's becoming part of my life perspective each and every day. So this, there's this, this is process of growth and maturing that we also refer to as sanctification, which is also salvation. So he says, hey, it's time to live who you are. If you don't know Jesus, the right time to do that is right now. If you do know Jesus, the right time to live it is right now. Listen, believe, receive, live out what God's called you to live. Dare to live the new life. And that's the call. And that's, that's the word I want to share with you today is just about the, the call of what, what does it mean so that we're not living below the standards. We're not living on some kind of sub-basement, sub-par level. We really are letting Jesus work in us and work through us and, and use our lives for his glory. There's two, two main things I want you to capture as we share this verse this morning out of this as we look at it. One is this. I've been changed. That's what he's saying here. You're a new creation. How'd that happen? Why did it happen? I mean, why did I need to be changed? But then there's a second part of the why question. I want to, to broaden a little more. I have been changed why? to impact the world around me. I mean, what, what God has given me. He talks about a ministry. He talks about a message. He talks about the word of reconciliation. And he talks about the motivation. What, what should be the, the, the stimulus in my heart and life to live out this new life? What, what should excite me even? What should stir me? What should put some unction inside my function to live out the new life? So as we look at this today, let's look at part one where he talks about, you know, I, I have been changed that I really am a new creature. I want you, just think about it for a moment. When I gave my life to Jesus, I'm not, from that point on, I'm not what I used to be. In fact, if, you're, if you are what you have always been, you're probably not a Christian. A Christian is someone, throughout the New Testament, you see, has undergone a change in their life. 
Their sins are forgiven. They're no longer bound to the old nature, even though it's present in their life. They live from a new relationship. He says here, there's, there's all these things become new. We're transformed. Old things are, are passed away. Old values, old systems of values, old, old ideas, old loves, old desires, old plans. He said new things have, have come now to, to, to replace those old things. You're, you're different. So if I'm a new creation in Jesus Christ, there's this new life. I've been separated from that, what we call in scripture, from Adam, all right? My, my existence now is here physically because God created Adam and he placed him in the garden. And out of Adam, every one of us have come, all right? We're all here because of the first man, Adam and Eve. And we're all a part of that family. But the problem with that family is it's dysfunctional in the, in the purest sense of the word because of sin. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We are all born sinners because of Adam and Eve. That's, that's the old plan. That's the old life. That's the old family tree. But when you come to Jesus Christ, guess what? We die to the old family tree and we come alive in a new family tree. Now we're of the second Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ, who's risen from the dead, who's conquered sin, who took our sin upon him. And we are this new person. We, we have this new life and in comes new plans, in comes new perspective, in comes new desires, in comes new loves. And, and it's not that I am not taunted, so to say, by the old family and by the old ties and by the old desires because I'm still in this body of flesh. But now on board in my life, the Holy Spirit is living and he's given me a whole new way of seeing things and a whole new way of living my life. That's why it's important that I embrace the truth of that and dare to live that new kind of life. The most new thing of all of it is this new relationship. No longer to Adam, but now to the Lord Jesus Christ, who has set me free from the laws of sin and death that held Adam into captivity. Let me just give you a quick overview of a few verses through the scripture. See if you little sink in a little bit about who you are. According to Matthew, we shared this last week, I am the salt of the earth. According to what Jesus says in Matthew, I am the light of the world. Now don't get arrogant, but this is true. I'm salt there. It's nice when people say that about you, but have you ever said it about yourself? I am salt there. Try that. Go ahead. And I am the light. Now let's try it together. I am the salt of the earth. I'm the light of the world. <laughs> Boy, it must be a dim white bulb. <laughs> I am the light of the world. Yes, we are. We need to understand. This is what the Bible says about us. All right. I'm not just making this up. All right. I didn't look in the book of Job this morning. I looked in the book of God and God's word says these things about me. It's what Jesus says in the book of John. I'm a child of God. According to first John, I've been born of God. I'm part of the true vine. According to John 15, which means I'm part of the very life of Christ. John 15, 15 says he doesn't call me a slave. He calls me his friend. Who are you friends with? I have people all the time try to impress me with who their friends are. You, you've had that, you know, well, I know. So, so, yeah, yeah. Well, well, I talked to the president today or I talked to the boss of the company and the CEO says, and you know, we're all chummy and rubbing shoulders about trying to make about who we can drop a name with. Let me drop a big name for you. I know Jesus. Let me see what this means. I know Jesus Christ, the Lord of the universe. By name? I'll tell you something about he knows me. He knows who I am. He knows what's going on with me. He stays in constant touch with me. I mean, I just don't have his, his phone number. I have his attention. I just don't have a prayer line number. I got his attention. And so you're going to drop a name? Drop that one. <laughs> All right. I'm a friend of Jesus. I, next time the devil shows up, just say, hey, you better be careful. You know who I'm friends with? <laughs> You've got to embrace this. I mean, this, it has to be, it, it's so elementary, but yet it, it is extremely profound. I am a friend of Jesus. I am chosen by God. I'm appointed by Christ to, to bear his image, to bear his fruit, to reflect his life and his glory. The Bible tells us in the book of Romans, Paul writes, I am a slave of righteousness. I, I, I'm a servant of the Lord. I'm a son of God. God's spiritually my father. And we see this over, and this is just a few illustrations of scripture. Uh, Romans 8, I'm a joint heir with Christ. He shares his inheritance with me. All right? I, the way God treats Jesus is the way God wants to treat me, basically. 
I'm a joint heir. I'm on the same level with, with the Lord Jesus in regard to all the things that belong to him. God has also placed in my hands to share with Jesus Christ. This is, this is who I am. This is who you are in Christ. First Corinthians tells us we are the temple. We're the dwelling place of a holy God that the Holy Spirit now abides and dwells within us. I am united to the Lord. Catch this. I am one spirit with him. Everybody's looking for that soulmate. It's Jesus. <laughs> it goes deeper than that. He's my spirit mate. We are on the same page. We're in the same chapter. We're, we're living. He lives in me. There's not a thing I do he's not aware of. He loves me that much. He's that committed to me. I'm a fellow citizen. I'm a prisoner of Christ. I'm made righteous. I'm holy. Let me look in the book of Philippians. Well, let's go to uh, get the right number here. In, in Ephesians. In Ephesians says, I'm a saint. Some of you have struggle with that. No, the church doesn't have to venerate you or anything. You don't have to prove any certain amount of miracles. You're a saint because God made you a saint. It's part of your identity of Christ. I am God's workmanship. Ephesians 2.10 says, I am his handiwork. It's a word also used for poem. That I am God's message to the world. I'm his work that the world, that he puts on demonstration of what God can do in life. You and I are that poem. We're that demonstration of his work. And in regard to that, I'm now also a fellow citizen with the rest of God's family. And he doesn't have any stepchildren. We're all on the same ground. We're all equal. You, I, I, you know, I can't say, well, God loves me more than he loves you. Any more than you can. God loves us uh, together as children. I'm a prisoner of Christ. I'm righteous. I'm holy. And Colossians, uh, Philippians says, I am a citizen of heaven. I am seated with Christ. Even in Philippians, they were seated in Christ in heavenly places in Ephesians 2. Colossians says, I am hidden with Christ in God. Here's God the Father. Christ is in God. I'm in Christ. That's protective. Amen. Just as much as Christ is in me, the Holy Spirit's in me, I'm in him. We're in each other, with each other, part of each other. I literally become an expression of the life of Jesus Christ because he is my life. Now, if I can begin just to get a little bit of idea of what all that meant <laughs> and what all that's saying, will it not change my perspective about living itself? Most of the people that the world deals with in their hangups and their hassles and their complications, the world will say, you know, they just don't know who they are yet. They need to discover just who they really are and how valuable they really are. Well, in, the, in your old Adamic nature, in the, you're never going to discover anything worth finding there. But in Christ, who sees you and d restores you and makes you new, you'll find the fullness of your identity there. And if you don't find it, then you'll live, as we said before, in this some kind of sub-basement spiritual life. Catch what when John writes, John the Beloved, 1 John, he says, I am a child of God. And when he returns, according to 1 John 3, he's going to make me like him completely. Completely glorified. I'm not just a child. He's going to receive me someday. I am born of God. And so are you. In fact, he says in 1 John 5, and the wicked one cannot touch me. Tell that to the devil next time he shows up. My daddy says, you can't bother me. You can't touch me. I belong to him. You can't touch me. You may tempt me, you may try to entice me, but you can't touch me. I belong to Jesus. I am lock, stock, and barrel owned by the Heavenly Father. Now I just need to make sure I'm owned and operated by the Heavenly Father, that he's in charge. I am what? A new creation. Now you get a little bit of insight there when you take all these passages of Scripture, and there are many, many more, by the way, but just a little insight from those that talk about you are a new creation. If any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things become new. The idea of the verb tense of that passage is that there was something that happened in the past, and it has this continual recurring effect in my life in the present right now. New heart, new mind, new eyes, new inclinations new perspectives, new, new way of living. Yes, in the midst of this old creation, but I have this new creation. In the midst of this old world, I am this new creation. I've been changed. I mean, that's good enough shouting ground right there. I have been changed. I am not what I used to be. You have been changed. Hallelujah. So don't let Satan claim those old things. Now, I have been changed, but there's a, there's a reason why I have been changed, all right? 
How I have been changed has everything to do with it. One, it's through Christ. That's the only way a change is going to come, first of all. You have to know Jesus Christ. You can't be good enough. You can't be moral enough. You can't hold a high enough ethical code and embrace it in your life. You just can't do all these things and reach this standard up here where God is. He's holy. The Bible says we always fall short. We're not going to reach it of our own merit. Go to church, be a good daddy, be a good mama, be a good kid. Don't lie, cheat, and steal, all the other things. You can try all that you want, but you're never going to be a new creature by self-effort. You cannot do it for yourself. You cannot do it unto yourself. You have to be made a new creature. And he says here in verses 17, 18, 19, it was through Christ, in Christ. So the only way I'll ever be a new creature, enjoy all these privileges I just spoke about, is to have this new identity given to me through Christ. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. The only way to new creation, the only way to the heavenly creation is through him. And how does that work? Well, it says he doesn't count their trespasses against them. That's verse 19. Namely, God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. Let me just reinforce that. Not counting their trespasses against them. How many in this room, you don't have to raise your hand because I know it's 100%, have ever sinned? Yeah, amen. We've all sinned, right? How many of you have sinned a lot? <laughs> all of you, all of us, sinned a lot. How many of you have done things that were dishonoring to God? A lot of us. How many of us cloned our own will, our own way, our own self, demanded our own, on our own rights instead of surrendering to God? All of us. And the, and the Bible says because of what Christ has done when we turn in faith, he doesn't count that against us. Well, that's not like us. Somebody does us wrong. We're going to hold, we, we got the records, right? You know, I've got that little book somewhere. It's not visible, but it's been written into many times. Oh, I see you did that again. Okay, I got that down. Let me see you do that one more time. And we're willing at times when somebody does something offend us, we pull out our book. Yeah. Back on Friday, you did the same thing to me. Now, let me show you. And the week before, you remember that? And it was September 12th, 1947. You did it then. <laughs> I got it here. And we account those sins against people. God doesn't do that to you. God has wiped it clean. Your, your sins, though they were stained of scarlet that cannot be cleansed by anything, but the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. Hallelujah. So we're made new, all right? And, and I, if, 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 if my sins are counted against me, then I've got a big problem, which, you know, when I said, I, I, how I've been changed, I've been changed through Christ and God doesn't count his trespasses, my trespasses against him. So the second part of that is uh, that I needed to be changed. Why do I need to be changed? Because if he doesn't change me, I can't be acceptable. If he doesn't change me, he can't fellowship with me. If he doesn't change me, I can't understand him. If he doesn't change me, the Bible's nonsense. If he doesn't change me, righteous standards are, are a waste of time. If he, doesn't, if he doesn't change me, there's no hope for me to even try to live the Christian life. I can't do it. But he changes me, and so many people miss this. They think, well, he changed me so I can go to heaven. No, he changed you so that he could know you, and the only way he can know you is to deal with all those issues you got called sin, and so he does that by putting all that sin on Jesus, and now your sin is taken care of. Now you can be acceptable in his sight. I mean, where is the message gone anymore when we stand up and tell people, you must be saved because, oh, well, because God loves you and has one flavor of your life. Well, true. But the truth of the message is, you must be saved because you're offensive to God. We're offensive to God in our sinful state. It's offensive to God. But this is a beautiful love and grace of God, is it not? But even though we're offensive to him, he would send his son to take on all that offensiveness and die for our sins. And now he said, I'm not going to hold those against you. I'm going to forgive you of all those things and you'll be made acceptable and pleasing in my sight. He made me acceptable, the Bible says in Colossians, in the beloved. He'd made me righteous. Why? Because if I'm unrighteous, I'm unacceptable. So thank God for this grace. So there's this change that's come. It's through Christ. He doesn't count as trespass against us. I'm received now. I'm accepted by him. I, 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 I'm blessed by him. I'm made new by him. Now, I said this was kind of a two-part when we talk about the why. The first thing is, I'm a new creature. The second part of this message is, I've been changed. No, back that up. Where'd you go? 
Anyway, somebody's pushing buttons besides me. I have been changed to impact, what I tell you, I have been changed to impact the world around me. I've been changed to impact the world around me. Now, everybody wants to cheer and say, I've been changed. I'm a new creation. And I, and I understand the part I've been changed because, you know, I, it's through Christ and that was my life before that was offensive to God, so I'm acceptable to him now. But that's just one side of the coin. I've been changed to impact the world around me. This is the message of 2 Corinthians 5, 17, 18, and 19. You were this, God made you this, for this. You were this, God made you this, for this. We like to hear, you were this, we can deal with that, because he made us this, praise the Lord, we love that. We'll sing songs about it. We'll praise the Lord for it. But what about for what? I would say for something. That's why we said you're the salt of the earth. Salt has a compound. It, it is a compound that has certain qualities for something. Whether it's preserving, salt used to preserve it. Whether it's for seasoning and giving more flavor, something, it's for that. I mean, there's lots of uses that we have for salt from cleansing and everything else. But the salt is there for something. So you're here for something. Jesus said, if the salt's not salty, it loses its safer and it's good for what? Hey, well, it's still salt, but it's saltless salt. You're still a Christian, but you're a saltless Christian. And what does that mean? You're good for nothing. All right, I'm good, praise the Lord. Goodness of God is on my life. But what for? You're good for something. Are you good for anything? Is this new creature, are you good for anything? What are you good for? I mean, it's not like I'm trying to earn brownie points. What are you good for? I'm good for the glory of God. I, I'm good for the purposes of God. I'm good for the will of God. I'm good for whatever the plan of God is. Part of that old creation that died was my plans. Old things pass away. My plan's gone. His plan, what is it? Let's find it. Let's discover it. And what it will do, it will not only affect me, it will impact a world around me. And let me read these verses again in verse 19 and 20. He says, I have been... Let me get that battery fixed. Namely, God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against him, and he has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, which always means it's therefore, sir, here's what it's there for. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. He didn't say, therefore, I'm an ambassador for Christ. He said, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were entreating through us, we beg you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. And the idea here is anybody that comes reconciled to God, gives their life to Christ, becomes this same expression. We've been given a word of reconciliation. We've been given this ministry. We're ambassadors for Christ. And God's entreating people through us to, to come to Christ and be reconciled to Christ. This is a message obviously ingrained upon the very heart, soul, and life of the Apostle Paul. We talked about his, his change last week. We talked about Ananias, you know, and Ananias stepping out and risking everything to lead Paul to the, to, to the Lord and have his, pray for him and, 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 and take him from that place of A to, to B in the, in the steps of it. He's moving towards God at and what happens as part of all this, you see the change that comes into his heart is this passion, this passion for Israel to be saved, this passion for Gentiles to be saved, this passion for anybody bearing the name of human being to be saved. You know, you must be born again. He, and he said, he said, we're here for, the, for this reason. If you look at scripture and you see that the life of the apostle Paul, remember when he goes in the book of Acts and he comes into the city of Athens and he's going to go up to Mars Hill and he's going to preach there in Athens. As he's going through the city, he said that his spirit was being provoked within him as he was observing the city full of idols. I mean, there's something, he's just, he's in, he's in the midst of, of this world he sees all the sin of the world. He sees all the idolatry of the Grecians, all right? It's pervasive everywhere he goes. There's idols everywhere. People are wearing them. People have them erected all around. He's going to Mars Hill where there's thousands of idols all over this to every kind of God you can think. I mean, probably got the God of peanut butter up there or something, you know? There's just everything you can imagine. And he goes up there and he said, on his way, man, God's just doing something in his heart. There's this provoking thing. And he's, he, I think it's a righteous indignation not towards the sinners, but towards the sin. All right? Somehow we forgot God still loves sinners. You know? Yeah, I'm sorry, sinners. He still loves us. <laughs> he loves people. And yes, we can be angry at the sin. We're angry at the idolatry, as, as Paul said. Provoked in the spirit. But provoked him to get up and preach the message of grace. 
to this time of ignorance God has winked at now commands all men everywhere to repent, to give their lives to Christ. God's provided a plan. God's provided an avenue and a way where you can really know him. The true unseen God. And he preaches the message of grace because there's this passion. It's part of this new life and this new creation in Jesus Christ. So he goes through Athens and you see it demonstrated in Athens. Then he goes, he writes to Rome. He says to them, I don't want you to be unaware, brethren, that often I have planned to come to you. And I've tried, but I've been prevented so far. The Lord hadn't allowed it yet, but I know it's going to happen. He said, I want to come. Why? Just so I can shake hands, see you, and stay in the best hotel in Rome? No, I want to come that I can see some of you come to Christ and we can see some of your friends and some of your family. In other words, that there may be fruit as a result of my visit. You realize what he's doing there? Fruit as a result of it. And then you see him again in Corinth. He starts off his letter, I've come to preach the gospel. All right. I'm here in Corinth to preach the gospel. Some men may mock at that, some may laugh at that, some may call that foolishness, but it's the preaching of Jesus Christ that brings lost people to the cross and to Jesus Christ. So we're not ashamed of it. He says in one place in, in 1 Corinthians, I, there's this internal compulsion, you know, there's this compulsion in me that I just, if I don't do it, woe is me. And I think that most Christians, if they'll be honest with you, somehow sense that in their spirit and life. I mean, what is the very first thing, you know, if, if, if that you did, I mean, probably even if you got saved at six, 16 or 60, I've, I've always seen it pretty much the same in everyone. I, I need to tell somebody. I need to call mama. I need to tell somebody. You know, I, I, I need to let somebody know. I, I need to call my uncle. And then we start thinking about people that, that, that we know that are saved that well, we want to tell them. But then we start thinking about people that we know that aren't saved, how we need to tell them. It's just, it's just a, it's a, it's an earmark, so to say, of the new life in Christ. And this is where the apostles taking this passage in Corinthians and putting it all together. It says, you're a new creation. Now you're an ambassador. You're a new creation. Now you have the ministry. You're a new creation. Now you've been called to God. Let God speak to you. They work hand in hand. It's the old story. You've heard me say it before. If it were not true, there'd been two preachers there the day you got saved. One to lead you to the Lord and pray with you and you trust Christ, maybe to baptize you. The second one just to shoot you. Bam! God's will is accomplished. He's going to heaven. I mean, if that, is that the end result? Just get to heaven? No, it's not God moving in the earth to get a sinner out of the earth up into heaven. It's God moving in the earth, in the heart of people, to draw them to him so he can get heaven into earth. His message into the hearts of people. And who's supposed to do that? Each and every one of us. Anybody that would bear the title, new creature bears the same word of reconciliation and the same ministry of reconciliation. Well, that's just not my personality. No, it is not in your old person. But it's ingrained into your new one. It's not part of your makeup in the old person. But it is in the new person. And you'll find that whenever you're walking really with the Lord, and you're really right with the Lord, and you're walking in the Spirit, and you're being led to the Spirit in your life, there's always this burden starts, God starts building for people that are without Christ and people that don't know the Lord. So we've experienced this change so as we can be acceptable to God and also so we can impact the world around us. Let me, let me give you one more passage here. And to some people, when you read this next passage, it's shocking just how much Paul had a passion and a burden for people to be saved, especially those of his own family and tribe. It says in Romans here, and it, it is shocking, it's poignant, but it gives you a little glimpse into where he's at. I am telling the truth, he says, in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief from, in my heart. I wish that I, myself, and this is what's powerful, were cursed, separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren and my kinsmen according to flesh. My heart breaks for my own. So much so, I know what awaits them without Christ. I'm willing to go pay that price myself. Isn't that, though, the love of Jesus? Isn't that what Jesus did for us? Isn't that exactly what Christ did for us? He gave himself. He became accursed. He who knew no sin, it says this passage, became sin that we might be made right with God. God did that for you. God did that for me. But I really believe, as, and he says, in the Spirit, when I am walking in the Spirit, that same passion 
is there and is present in our life, but will we respond to it? Will we choose to live out who we are or what we used to be? What identity are we going to live from? What life are we going to live in? What life are we going to claim? And here's what the Lord's done for you in the context of this. And I'll wrap it up with three quick points. One, he's given us a ministry of reconciliation, it says there in verse 18. Whereby, he's given us a ministry of reconciliation and has committed to us the word of reconciliation, the scripture tells us. Ministry is the Greek word we get for deacon. It's diakonai, it has to do with servant. In other words, God's called, now that we're new creations, part of this new life is service to the Lord. And it's really a service to others. He's given us a ministry. What kind of ministry? A ministry of reconciliation. The word here in the Greek language means to take people or parties that used to be friendly and united but have now separated and there's a disagreement or there's animosity or enmity between them and to go and reconcile those two parties together, to bring them back together. God said, that's the ministry, that's the ministry Jesus had, all right? What did Jesus, he said, Jesus came and he reconciled you back to the God, to the Father. How did he do that? He paid the price for your sin. And now he's given you a ministry to go tell people about that. And the way that they can be reconciled to God, separated because of their sin, Scripture says we are at enmity with God when we're without Jesus. We're opposed to God when we're without Jesus. Our hearts are resistant to God. But when we hear the message and the Holy Spirit takes that message, brings it to life, what happens? We long for that. I, I know I need to get saved. I know I need to give my heart to God. And we, we come to Christ and guess what? Because someone was faithful to pray and someone was faithful to care and someone was faithful to share, we're reconciled. Somebody had a ministry of reconciliation in your life. I don't know who it was, but somebody did. Might have been several somebodies. They've been telling you. You might not want to hear it. You may be going la, 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 la the whole time. But they've been faithful to bear the ministry to you. You need to give your life to Jesus. You need to get your heart right with God. It could be parents. It could be friends. It could be pastors. But anyway, God has these ministers, these servants of restoring. That's what it is. The servants of restoring others that are out there. Who are they? They're us. We have met the restorers of salvation and they are us. All right. <laughs> We are them. That's the ministry God's given us. It's part of the new creation in Christ Jesus. He says, well, how do we do that? Well, that's the ministry, but he's also given us the message. He says he has given us, in verse 18 and 19, the word of reconciliation. Don't you love that? He gave you the word of reconciliation. It's in verse 19. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting the trespasses against him, but he's committed to us the word of reconciliation. Say it again. He's committed to us the word of reconciliation. He's committed to me the word of reconciliation. He's committed to you the word of reconciliation. What word is that? It's the gospel. Gospel. Jesus Christ came to die for your sins. You can know God. You can, you can have God in your life. You can be free from your sin. You don't have to go to hell and be judged for your sin. Christ took that judgment upon himself. He came, died on the cross. Three days later, rose from the dead. He's victorious over life, death, hell, the grave, the devil. You can be free. That's the word of reconciliation. Hallelujah. That's the word we share. That's as simple as it gets. He's coming again. You want to add something to it? But that pretty much wraps it up. You've been given that word. So you've been given this ministry of reconciliation and you've been given the word of reconciliation. But I said there's, I believe that there's a, there has to be an understanding that that's what he's given to us. In fact, the King James says he's committed it to you. And the word commit there is a word for a point. The word give there is the word means to appoint someone to something. It's the same word Jesus said, you didn't choose me, I chose you, and I appointed you to bear fruit. So here you are, I saved you, and I appointed you. So I saved you, well, as long as you're on the earth, here's what I want you to do. Yeah, you'll be a father, you'll be a husband, you'll be a wife, you'll be a son, you'll be a daughter, you'll be an employee, you'll be a, a boss, you'll be an owner, you'll be a manager, all these different, you may do all these things, but hey, in the middle of all that, wherever you're doing, whatever you're doing, wherever you're doing it, you're a minister there. Wherever we go, God's going to instruct us if our ears are open to show us where to fulfill that ministry, where to give that word of reconciliation. Let me be a little bit on the obvious here. What are words for anyway? Words are for communication. Words are for speaking. Words are for telling. So if God's given me some words of reconciliation, they're not just set for me to sit and ponder. <laughs> they're for me to use and to confess and to speak and to enjoy speaking them. So we have this, we have this ministry and we, that he's given us and we, we, we have this, this message now that he's also given us, but he also... I think here's where the motivation come in. The motivation is, he says, 
So I'm calling you ambassadors for Christ. I mean, how would you like to get a call from the president's office today and say, you know, we'd like to appoint you as an ambassador to a particular foreign country. You know, to me, they'd probably send me to Iran or something. You know, but, <laughs> you know, can, can, I, can I be the ambassador to, to Greece or something? You know? uh, well, that's a, that's a stately privilege and honor. We say, you're going to represent this sovereign country to the rest of the world. God says, you're going to represent your sovereign father and his kingdom to the rest of the world. That is a privilege. That's not a, that's not a terrible responsibility. That's not a horrible burden to have to bear. That's a tremendous blessing and privilege that God would title me ambassador. Ambassador. I'm tried to use that as much. When I was traveling evangelism, I always used that everywhere I went. Where, what do you do? I'm an ambassador. Got me good seats on the airlines and good rooms in the hotels. You're an ambassador? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Here, take this room five over you. This is a really good room. Thank you. What country do you represent? Heaven. I want to take the key back, but it's too late. <laughs> Get the best car at the rental place. Get the best room on the seat on the plane. I've been upgraded before telling, telling the steward as, uh, as an ambassador. <laughs> I am. Hey, I am. Not a lie, I'm an ambassador for Christ. It doesn't get any bigger than that. I mean, you stand an ambassador by Christ, by an ambassador for, to, to the UN or something, it's, pff, so what? You know, the kingdom of God? You represent Who? You talk about a name dropping, that's, that's pretty big name dropping. He's literally appointed us. And what it gets down to is means that he has laid a charge to, my, to, 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 to me and I'm responsible for it. And I act now as this authorized representative to, to represent the kingdom of God to the world around me. So wherever you are in, tomorrow on your job or in the world, you're there as an ambassador. You really are. If they want to know what heaven's like, if they want to know what the king's like, they can look to you. Because you're going to act in ways that are in accordance with, the, with your country, with your kingdom, or with your king. You'll respond in that way. And, and I love this verse in, in, where he says it. And he said, it's as though God were entreating you through us. Because that's literally what happened. When we speak on behalf of the Lord, he's entreating the world around us. Through us, he's working in us. He's given us a message. He's given us the ministry. He's given us the motivation to do it. And so he's speaking through us to the people around us. So it's just as it's, 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 it's though your heavenly father is saying it to him because you're saying it because you have permission, because you've been anointed to do it, because you've been appointed to do it. You have what you need and you go out and you do it. ESV puts it this way. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through all of us. I want to ask you to raise your hand, but anybody in this room that's ever won anybody to Jesus, you wouldn't know exactly what I'm talking about. When I talk about there is no greater blessing that we experience in our life in those opportunities that we've had to share Christ and even greater when somebody comes to know Christ. It's just an exhilaration, you know, and it's a spiritual life. It's a spiritual unction. It's a spiritual energizing. I've gotten calls from many of you. You say, hey, I just led somebody to the Lord. I just led this guy. I just led this girl. And to hear the joy in your heart, you know, it excites me, you know, and it excites me when I get to win somebody to Christ. Uh, you may accomplish a lot of things in this world. We have a lot of people come through our church and in our church, you've accomplished great things in the business world and you know, different levels of life and different letters of medicine and success in their fields and on and on and on the list could go. But listen, there's no greater impact that we make than spiritual impact. I mean, when I stand before the Lord one day and he says, come up here, Joe, he's going to say, man, I'm so proud of you. I can't believe it. I mean, your car was never dirty. You always kept it washed. And the tires, you always rotated and balanced. Man, I'm so proud. That's a good thing. Good job. Hey, yard of the month three times. Big sign in the front. Everybody knew. It's great. It's marvelous. Oh, yeah. And, and top those sales. How many times, how many months in a row did you do that? You beat everybody out of sales. That's, that's fantastic. That's not what we're going to stand for the Lord on. That's going to all go by the side. But when the Lord says to me, Joe, come here, he starts calling some names of my family or my friends or people I have the opportunity to leave Jesus. And even those I didn't, I didn't know that I'd led the Lord and a, a part of it reaching. Through my giving, through my sharing, through my inviting them to meetings, whatever, those people are going to come forward. 
Paul said, that's my crown of rejoicing. That's what makes the difference. To see that, that's, that's, to see, that's genuine impact. I may not impact you to be the most powerful person in your position on your job, but if I impact you to win somebody to Christ, and you start impacting the world around you, I want you to know, the world may not know who you are, but I'll tell you one thing, God knows who you are. And you'll be like the Ananias, and the Lord said there was a certain disciple named Ananias. You'll be on that certain disciple list. When God needs to reach somebody, he's got your number. You'll, you'll be that individual. When God says, here's somebody I can use to make a difference, a real difference, to impact the world around them. That's the impact that makes a difference. It's eternal. It's eternal. And I know we get so preoccupied with this physical world because we don't perceive the eternal around us so much, but it's here, and we're in the midst of it. And we need to realize that God wants to move through us as though he's speaking through us. The greatest of all blessings. I kind of pin this out just to, to, of all the great things you may accomplish in the world, none will be greater than you proclaiming the message of Jesus Christ. Nothing. Nothing's going nothing to hold any water near that. Nothing's going to measure it. The times that you'll just speak out and talk about Jesus, share Jesus, live Jesus, that's, impact lives around you, there's nothing greater than that. And we don't always see it. We don't always recognize it. We don't see the validity of it. But you'd be surprised how many people have come to Christ and say, you know, it's because of so-and-so's testimony or because of their life and because of their message they continue to be that I'm here today, that I give my life to Jesus. Every one of us have a testimony on some level like that. Somebody made a difference around us. Pastors, friends, relatives, moms, dads, brothers, sisters. Who was it? Well, God has the same thing for our life as well. There was a great preacher in the late 1800s, most of his ministry in the early 1900s. I think he passed away in 1950-something. His name was J.E. Conant, wrote lots of articles, did lots of lessons and teaching around the country. But he said this. He said, there's really even no victorious living apart from a spontaneous and all-consuming passion for continuous personal evangelism. What does that mean? You know, you're just not going to enjoy the fullness of life unless you start talking about Jesus. That's the simple version. And sharing Christ. And if it takes a bracelet to wake me up in the morning to say, hey, you know, I need to be cognizant of the fact God has a plan for my life today. And there's people out here that I'm going to come across, and I'm probably not going to be aware of them if the Holy Spirit doesn't remind me. So, Lord, I trust you. You're going to show me, speak to me, use me, however you want to use me today. I want to be a vessel. Because you've given me this new life. I'm a new creature. Point one. Point two. But I'm a new creature to impact the world around me. Don't live half of that life. And a lot of people are real good at living half of that life. I'm a new creature. And they get real good at being a new creature. But they're good for nothing. You're know, like salt without savor. Get the other half of that coin. I'm here for a reason. Isn't that exciting news, though? That's not some terrible burden. We treat it like it's bad news. That's good news. And God wants to do something with your life that literally transforms and changes people for eternity. Hallelujah. Would you stand with your heads bowed? Father, thank you for your word today to our lives.